on your radio, on Global Player and Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 8 o'clock, Liz Truss has received a boost in her bid to become Tory leader. She's got the backing of former candidate Penny Mordaunt, who narrowly lost out to the Foreign Secretary for a place in the final two with Rishi Sunak. The Trade Minister has addressed party members this evening at the latest hustings in Devon. She, for me, is the hope candidate. And that is why I am here tonight, to be straight with all of you and to tell you that my choice in this contest to lead us and our nation is Liz Truss. Bart's Health NHS Trust in London says there'll be no change to the care for 12-year-old Archie Battersby while his family appeals to the Supreme Court. He's been declared brainstem dead by doctors. His parents want to stop life support being withdrawn tomorrow. The first ship carrying Ukrainian grain since the Russian invasion in February has sailed from the port of Odessa. It's carrying more than 26,000 tonnes of corn to Lebanon. Downing Street says Boris Johnson will definitely want the Lionesses to receive the recognition they rightly deserve after England's Euros triumph. The team celebrated their 2-1 success against Germany earlier with a presentation in front of thousands of fans in Trafalgar Square in London. In the city, the FTSE 100 closed down 10 points at 74.13. The pound buys $1.22 and €1.19. LBC weather tonight, rain in the northwest, dry and muggy in the south. Tomorrow, rain in central areas, very warm across southern and eastern England with a high of 28 degrees. From Global's Newsroom for LBC, I'm Andy Ivey. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation cross-question with Ian Dale. Hello, very good evening. It's coming up to two minutes past eight on LBC. Welcome to uh, Monday's edition of Cross Question. Uh, joining me on the panel, the economist and commentator Grace Blakely, uh, Robert Colville. He is economist on the Sunday Times and is director of the Centre for Policy Studies Think Tank. Uh, Ryan Shorthouse is director of the Bright Blue Think Tank. We're going to do a lot of thinking in this hour. And Jonathan Liss is not a director of a think tank yet. I was. But, well, you were, weren't you? But you're only a deputy, so that doesn't count. Uh, he's a political commentator. So we've got lots to talk about about over the course of the coming hour. I'm relying on you to ask some brilliant questions to our panel, 0345 6060 973. You can text your question to 84850. And don't forget to watch us on Global Player. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. It's really funny. Um, as you know, I haven't been here for the last week, but the previous week to that, virtually all the questions on Cross Question were about the Tory leadership contest. Not today, you'll be pleased to hear. Uh, let's go to Martin in Doncaster for the first question. Hello, Martin. Hi, Ian. Yeah, I'm glad you're better as well. Lucky you, actually. Thank you. Well, um, I'm not, but yeah. anyway, carry on. <laughs> Do the panel think the Lionesses winning the Euros will be a game changer? Well, I'm going to be gratuitous and come to the only woman on the panel on, on this. <laughs> Are you into football? I can't say that I'm extremely enthused. I'm not an aficionado, but I did watch the game with my boyfriend uh, yesterday. Um, and it was very exciting for a football game. And it was obviously great that we won. I mean, I'm kind of wondering in what sense it, will it be a game changer? In what sense is, is the question being asked? I think that I mean, there have been a lot of particularly, I think, under 10-year-old girls and teenage girls right. who may become very much inspired by yeah, the Yeah, I mean, you weren't allowed to play football as a girl at my school or any of the, like, inverted commas, boys' sport. Oh, school. Yeah, it was about a relatively <laughs> posh school. <laughs> um, but, I, I mean, I remember there was to one the girl... Because I was a boy at my comprehensive. Well, there we go, days. that's terrible. There was one girl who really wanted to play cricket and she kind of launched a campaign to be able to be, join the boys' cricket team and she was kind of bullied relentlessly for it, eventually managed to to do it. But, you know, you just weren't able to play boys' sports mm. ago. It was netball and round, rounders was obviously a great sport, but it's not quite... So how did the conversation go during the match between you and your boyfriend? Was he sort of chuntering along, saying, well, it's not the same as men's? No, he was deeply, he, he was deeply, deeply enthused. I mean, he was utterly heartbroken when we lost the men's Euros, like, mm. ir inconsolable for weeks. Um, so he was very, very happy yesterday and kind of a bit emotional. So it kind of, you know, I just went along with that, really. OK. <laughs> Not that you, I have you, much else you, to add. You kind of let your sex down with that answer. I'm sorry. Like, oh, I think, you know, as a woman, I should have the right Lord. to be not into football as I, much as I, I should have no, the right absolutely. to play football. You're absolutely right. Jonathan. <laughs> um, 
I think, I hope it would be a game changer in the sense that women's football is taken more seriously uh, in the sense that, you know, women's sport should always be taken more seriously in general and seen on a, on a level with uh, men's sports. And the, the fact that we think of sport as a, often as a default male pursuit uh, speaks for itself. I thought, you know, I was reading that there are some members of the team who have full-time jobs and are training to do things which is obviously unheard of in men's football and that some you know a woman who is on a second a second uh, tier football team might earn £21,000 a year which is less than what a premiership male football would earn in a week so obviously there is a financial element but we've seen that this has obviously generated a lot of excitement and so there should be you know funding and sponsorship and actual money in it as well so women can participate across all levels but i think that that is where it's likely to be more of a game changer because you you can't argue that um women footballers should be paid the same as men when the, the, com the commercial reality is that there isn't the sponsorship there, that the crowds aren't there. You go to a women's Super League match and if you've got a crowd of a thousand, you're doing quite well for, for some of them, not all, but for some. Um, so until the money comes in, that's the biggest ever, wasn't it? They, they were there last night, but that, that was a one-off game and the, the hope has got to be that that will now sort of filter down into the Women's Super League for normal matches over the course of the season. But that's not going to be a short-term thing, is it? No, but there's no reason why why in the future you couldn't see women's football in the same way that you now see women's tennis, where there genuinely is an yeah. equality. You don't assume that a tennis match, a major tennis match, is going to be between men. And that really is as close to equality as you can get in sport. And so there's no reason why that's happened you know, for the last 120 years and it hasn't happened in mm. other sports. OK, Ryan? Well, I do think women should play five sets, though, in the Grand Slams. I mean, that, should, I think that would create agree, true actually. equality. Um, and I agree that they should be equal paid work, the same. Equal also, um, exactly. Uh, to be honest, like Grace, I'm not actually into football, men's or women's, so I'm a terrible person to ask. But, I mean, it was amazing. And let's hope that it increases both government and commercial funding into women's sport so that women don't have to be... Uh, doing it on an amateur basis, but it's full-time professional and it leads to, uh, you know, lots more girls being inspired by it. That's all I've got to say, really. <laughs> Don't that's that's absolutely fine. Um, Robert, are you going to tell me you're not a football fan as well? No, I'm going to, I'm going to say I'm, I, 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 I'm really happy that, um, that women's football is getting back to where it used to be before the evil patriarchy uh, at the FA decided to effectively ban it um, de decades ago. I think, I mean, it, it, you know, it's not just this match. The, the growth in, in, in uh, profile for women's football and the, and the growth in the quality of the, of the, of the, of the games has been, it has been extraordinary and really, really encouraging. But I think it's part of a, a broader thing. I mean, I think if you look at the, the Commonwealth Games, for example, um, you're not only have i think that you know you're not only having um you know the, the men's events and the women's events but you're having um in swimming and triathlon for example you're having um men and women competing as in, in, in the same teams and they've also brought the paralympics uh so not the paralympics but they've the, they're having the, the the para events at the yeah. at the same time and i think that's just it's, it's it's whatever you know obviously the gold standard will always be you know the premier league the the, the, the men's game but whatever you can do to increase exposure whatever you can do to you know it, you, you, you know, for the, for the money you spend on a single transfer, if you're a Liverpool club, you can, uh, you know, a Liverpool or a Man City, you can fund your entire, you know, you can fund a really good women's football team for an, for an entire year. And, you know, so, so you don't need to get equal money. You just need to get a, a, a tiny, fr the sponsorships and the, you know, and the coverage and the interest up to get a really good um, thing going. I, I thought one of the interesting things yesterday was that although it is intrinsically the same sport it, it's still very different isn't it because the crowd sounds different you don't have all of the theatrics where the players rolling over 10 times to sort of make out that they're, they're injured it, it was sort of almost it was a sort of Pure kind of football. And even nice though, well, well, it's, on, on, it's the other hand, on the other hand, on the other hand, the Germans were putting in some some, some reducers in in the uh, in the tackle. I mean, they weren't they weren't going easy. There were quite a lot. No. there were quite a lot of cards going. They? Why should they? Yeah. That's what you expect from the Germans. <laughs> but do, do do you think that, do you think that to add a note of controversiality into the conversations, if I just didn't do that, um, that we're being slightly force fed women's football that. Uh, the other day when we won the semi-final, 13 minutes on the 10 o'clock BBC News on the fact that the English women's football team had reached the final of the European Championship. And I'm thinking, are, are we all being told that we should like it? And I mean, I don't, I have, I'll be completely honest, I did watch the match yesterday and I sort of 
vaguely enjoyed it, but it, I didn't find it the same. And yet there are plenty of other women's sports that I will absolutely follow slavishly, but women's football is not one of them. And yet I'm made to feel guilty as if I'm being somehow misogynistic. Who's for, making you feel not, guilty well, for not liking it? Like, I don't like it. I don't feel misogynistic. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm very glad to hear, <laughs> glad to hear that. <laughs> I, I think that idea slightly, that we're being force-fed it well, is a I bit, think, a I bit think much. We, we are a little bit. For, for, a compar- for a sport which is a minority interest sport, it has to be but said. I think it was the similar... It th- is getting... I would say, more coverage than it merits. It was a similar thing with the Euros, right? It's not just about the sport itself. It's actually about the feeling that people get participating in this mass mm. event where everyone's watching. Which is being hosted here as well. Exactly. And like the excitement that there was around the men's Euros. And, and the Olympics the as well. You know, the Olympics, you might get, that. you know, if we win a gold medal in some minority sport, that gets to sort of 10 minutes yeah. at the beginning of the news as well. So it's just, you know, whatever happens to be, and obviously it is August as well. So, you know, there's yeah. <laughs> not much. And, and also, as I suspect, <laughs> we'll find out over the rest of this hour. But the rest of the news is pretty pretty awful at the moment like, it's not it's not it's not a happy place to be so just having something un, you know and we beat the germans something un, what's something not kind of, yeah, exactly. <laughs> i love did you see the meme from jeremy vine today he, he retweeted it from somebody else where they've got the sort of it says men semicolon it's coming home it's coming home football's coming home and then women 50 years later okay i'll fetch it then <laughs> I thought that was very funny. Um, right, let's, oh. move, let's move on to uh, Martin. Thank you very much. You had to see it, maybe, rather than you've been telling it. It's the way you tell them. It, 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 it isn't the way I tell them. I think that's what we've discovered. Right, Laura is in Twickenham. Hello, Laura. Hiya. Uh, mine's um, a question in relation to your last conversation um, regarding the London Living Rent Scheme. I wondered if this, or why this hasn't been um, expanded to the rest of the country to give people the opportunity who are privately renting to save to buy. Now, can you explain to us in 30 seconds what the London Living Rent Scheme is? Okay, it is a pot of money or a grant that uh, the Mayor of London gives housing housing associations or councils um, some money for when they do new build uh, development. He'll say, right, you need to make uh, 10 properties, for instance, London Living Rent, which is 60 to 80% market rent, tenancy, for five years to help people be able to buy that property or another property at the end of the five years. And is this working? It is, but they're very, very hard to find. I've literally just gone into one after 20 years of privately renting. My rent is now half. Um, It is a bit of a strict criteria with um, your income, but it should be promoted more with housing associations. They should be taking up the grant that he's providing and it should be out throughout the country. Why isn't it? The grant that he's providing, it's actually London taxpayers that are providing it in in the end, isn't it? Um, Robert, what what do you make of this scheme? Um, I think anything that gets people into home ownership is a, is a good thing i think um i mean this, this is basically affordable housing just with some with, with some extra on it that's that's how affordable housing works when developers build houses they have to carve off a certain mm. percentage to be done at market rate i mean fundamentally for me the the issue here is that we're not we, we're not building enough houses i think um there's all sorts of things you can do around the edges but you know we are spending the you know the how the bill for, bill for housing benefit which is the sort of nation it's effectively the nationwide version of this scheme it's what we pay to to help people live in houses who, who otherwise couldn't afford it. But that bill is shooting up into the billions and billions and billions and billions of pounds. Um, and it's fundamentally, I mean, this is a, an issue I'm, I'm religious and on, um, is because we we haven't built enough, we've been we've built fewer houses every decade since the nine, since the 1960s. So there's all sorts of things you can do about how you allocate the housing and how you help people into the housing. But fundamentally, we just need more housing. And it kind of almost doesn't matter what tenure it is. It, we just don't have enough of it. What, what about the point made by a caller in, in our last hour from Cambridge? He said that a lot of the houses that are being built around Cambridge, and there are a lot of them being built, they're all being bought up by investors Mm. or foreign investors, and very few of them actually go straight to a first-time buyer. Do you think there needs to be some more regulation of that? Well, so this is something that our think tank has shown, that um, in the ten ten years after the financial crisis, we actually, you know, the the amount of new housing we built was eclipsed by the growth of the buy-select sector. So effectively, we didn't build any new houses Mm. because they were just um, bought bought up by landlords. And that's that's been a function of partly mortgage regulation and partly interest rates. Just it's been, you know, it's been it's been so much. Basically, people have just had a lot of spare cash or been able to borrow easily and pumped it into the into the property sector. 
I don't really favour sort of re- artificial restrictions on who can who can buy what houses. I do think we need carrots, and you know, we we, we you know we need ca- carrots to persuade people to sell to, to sell home ownership. I think you know if we're building new ho- new social housing, it should definitely be preserved for you know if we're doing a new um, what's it called um, the new right to buy, it should definitely be you know there should be covenants to restrict that for own occupation. Eat, and so, but I I think some sort of thing saying you know banning ex- extra homes, I just think okay. doesn't work. Ryan. Yeah, I mean, I agree with Rob. There's definitely supply side constraints in London and the South East. I would also say that the problem with housing is also a distributional one, not just a supply side one, which is, I think you've seen in recent decades, um, you know, a huge growth in people buying more than one property. I think there's a figure, you know, a lot of baby boomers, one in six of them now uh, have got a second home. Interest rates have been very low. It's been very easy to borrow. Often people uh, use uh, their first property uh, to support them to get a second property by remortgaging it slightly. And so, you know, for example, in terms of the uh, the growth of the private rented sector in the past few decades, that represents about, uh, you know, a majority, three quarters of all new homes that were built um, or is equivalent to all the new homes that were built in that period. So really, you've got a bias in the market toward, against first-time buyers. Um, and I think the government's review of the mortgage market is probably the biggest game-changer here. You know, many decades ago, you could get 100% mortgages. Um, uh, we don't have that anymore. You need a very sizable deposit. And that is the biggest barrier to a lot of first-time buyers. You know, they could be on good wages, pay their rent on time for many, many years, but they just don't have the family support to pay the deposit. So I do think we need to look at alternatives to support people um, who don't have those big deposits. Jonathan? I think fundamentally, we always come back to the, the fundamental principle that housing is somewhere to live. And it's been treated for many decades as an asset above all else. And from that, so many other policies follow. Um, I don't see why we can't be much more uh, interventional, if you like, uh, with with housing in this country, you know, in the way that plenty of other cities across the capitalist world do. Rent caps, rent controls, controls on who is allowed to buy property, control on how many properties someone's allowed to buy, control on um, how many buy-to-let properties you can have, whatever it is. We are in this position where someone's right to have as many properties, as many assets as they like from wherever they they come in the world, for whatever purpose, seems to trump all other rights, and that can't be right. Chris? I'm, to be honest, relatively shocked to hear a level of consensus across the panel that housing has become primarily a financial asset rather than, you know, an ordinary commodity or even like a human right, um, which is definitely what we've seen over the past kind of, you know, 30, 40 years, really. This uh, conservative leadership race, which I know that we're not talking about too but much, we but do. it's, we well, do. these... But we do have a question on it. <laughs> well, the candidates are kind of <laughs> saying that they're competing to be the next Thatcher, right? And the reason that we have the housing situation that we have in this country really does go back to Thatcher. It goes back to the combination of the deregulation of the financial system with right to buy and, you know, the massive... Um, Um, just, uh, you know, increase in density of economic activity and therefore people in major cities um, that took place, you know, over the course of the 80s and uh, and 90s. Um, And dealing with those problems requires, as we've just heard, a whole load of different interventions. So yes, we probably do need rent caps that would certainly disincentivize landlords from providing uh, housing in the private rented market. That housing should then probably be taken back into the public sector as an asset, as it once was before it was sold off on the cheap at a loss. You know, uh, right to buy is still the biggest privatisation that the British state has ever undertaken. Um, And it was, again, you know, uh, a privatisation that was not particularly um, fiscally prudent, given that those assets generated revenue over the long term. So, and also because we now have this massive bill for supporting people in the private rented sector paying extortionately high rent. So we need to take a lot of housing back into the public sector. We need to build new social housing and we need some regulation of the private rented sector, as well as disincentivizing um, the financialization of housing, which requires a lot of kind of regulation of the financial sector, um, as well as, you know, people often have a second home because it's their pension. Pensions Mm. in this country are... Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, pensions are terrible. Like, we have the lowest state pension of, I think, any advanced country. Um, that's just not, you know, I think it's like 15 grand a year or something. It's not something that people can uh, can rely on. So that requires reform as well. And that, that, is, a, that is a real point, I think, in that um, people have 
slightly lost confidence in the pension system, so they regard property as their pension. And I'm I'm guilty of that myself in the... Um, but when Gordon Brown effectively ruined our pension system in 1997, I, I mean, I never had a big pension anyway, and still don't, um, I thought, well, property is the way to go. Well, I mean, and and, and a lot of other people have thought like that, and of course we are, we are part of the problem. I mean, Grace is blaming Thatcher for this. Um, or as, 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 as Should I not be blaming Thatcher? Are you blaming Blair? As the, guy who runs, <laughs> as the guy who runs a think tank founded by Thatcher, I would just point out <laughs> that, um, that social housing waiting lists actually fell during the heyday of the right to buy. That the, the, the problem, because what the problem st- the, the house prices start to absolutely mushroom under Blair and as you said uh, so there's not only the, well I mean there were a no, lot of macroeconomic reasons for that not, and obviously yeah, there's, there's a lag but there's not only the, there's not only a de attack on, on the, not only attack on private pen, private pensions um, but also Gordon Brown changes the mortgage uh, rate rules to make it mu- to make financing buy to let cheaper yeah. than buying than actually that is also true occupation. I mean like I, I think we can't avoid the fact that housing and finance in this country are deeply interrelated and you know it's like the vast majority of bank lending in general is directed towards mortgages. And that's at least partly why we've seen the explosion in house prices that we've seen over the past several decades. I mean, it's just been, as you said, low interest rates, extremely loose monetary policy, and banks that have been willing and able to lend pretty much only to... And, and, yeah, and legally legally obliged almost. Often. Rent only. But what we're talking about is a is justice, isn't it? Because, you know, you can buy a second property and that's, and that's fantastic, and a lot of people are in a position where they can use that as their pension. But, you know, most people of our age, you know, I'm talking, you know, of, I think all of us actually, um, particularly in London, and are not able to, to get on housing yeah. at all. And, no, and ultimately, that. I think I've said to you on this programme before, if you don't solve housing, then it's in the Tories' interest to solve housing because if young people totally can't, agree. Become, can't become homeowners, they will not vote yeah, Conservative. Totally agree. Uh, Robbie's written on my screen, shall we go to a break? <laughs> <laughs> we can, getting home I, know, I, know, I know we're late, but we were having a very interesting discussion, I think. It's 21 minutes past eight. This is LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. 23 minutes past eight. Uh, Grace Blakely, Robert Colville from the Centre for Policy Studies, Ryan Shorthouse from Bright Blue and Jonathan Liss are with us answering your calls. Now, let's go to John in Wallington. Uh, John, you've got a very meaty question for us. I have, Ian. <laughs> Evening to the panel. Um, given the situation in Ukraine with the Russian invasion, should Nancy Pelosi ignore the threats from China and go ahead and visit Taiwan? Such a difficult question, isn't that? Because there are, there are so many ramifications, which, whichever side of the argument you fall down on. Grace, let's start with you. I was hoping you weren't going to come to me. <laughs> <No>. Sorry. <laughs> 
Um, it is a complicated question. And, you know, in any of these cases, you can look at things from a kind of objective moral perspective, which I think we're wont to do when discussing them in the media. Or you can look at them from a kind of real politique, geopolitical perspective. And from the latter perspective, I mean, obviously, it is in no one's interest to escalate a conflict that is currently taking place between two major superpowers by, you know, drawing in another major superpower. Um, having said that, you know, like Taiwan is obviously a sovereign country and China is often behaving in a way that is like, you know, imperialist. So, yeah, I mean, how do you weigh up those moral versus geopolitical considerations? Like you have to just make a call based on, yeah, where you are. Do you think Nancy Pelosi should go? Um, I don't know. Do you think Nancy Pelosi should go? Luckily, I don't have to answer the questions. <laughs> Jonathan, you're keen to get in. Um, it's, a, it's a really interesting question. I, uh, I used to cover Taiwan quite a lot in my work at the European Parliament, and, and I went to, to Taipei on a delegation. I found it absolutely fascinating, and we kind of spoke to politicians across um, the spectrum there to find how they kind of navigate this sort of 70-year equilibrium, this, this fudge, effectively, where you have uh, this, this fallacy of... Um, kind of the one China policy where each each of the each of the Chinas is effectively claiming ownership of the whole, which is obviously ludicrous because there is no way that if you were ever to have you know the fall of the Communist Party in China, Taipei would not ever be running the whole of China. You know you cannot have you would not have the entire the whole of China being being ruled from an island, um, and so you just have these parties that are kind of inching towards a, a new position. But I think we have to put it into perspective. Taiwan, it's actually not, it's not really a sovereign country. It's never declared independence. Mm. It kind of claims ownership of the whole China, as I said. So it's never declared independence. If it did, that would be a de declaration of war de facto. So even though at the moment you have um, the party, uh, not the Kuomintang, the other party, I think it's called the DPP, um, which is um, sort of more left-wing and more kind of independently minded, they would never actually declare independence. Mm. So I think that obviously the United States has gone through a journey until the 1970s, it, rec it recognised Taiwan Taiwan as China, um, and then obviously it shifted its allegiance to the, the Communist Party because that, as most countries do, there are a few countries, I think a dozen countries in the world that recognise Taiwan, but that's mainly because Taiwan gives them money to do so, like many Pacific Island nations and so on. So I think that it would be a bold step for Pelosi to go, but I also think that Taiwan is doing everything it can and everything it should. You know, it's been, it's a healthy democracy and it has been for the last 35 years or so. And, you know, it's standing up for itself. And those are the, the freedoms that Americans love to talk about. And we can see what's happening in China um, with uh, the, the horrendous atrocities in uh, East Pakistan, uh, Xinjiang, um, and you know all kinds of all kinds of uh, crackdowns. And I think that it's incumbent upon the American government or the American apparatus to show some support for Taiwan. And nobody in their right minds thinks that Nancy Pelosi visiting Taipei is going to invite a nuclear response from Beijing. Do you think she should go? I do think she should go. Okay. Well, that. That was a brilliant answer, if I may say so, because I think everyone here will have learned something from mm. that and everyone listening, because it's one of those international things where we've all heard of Taiwan, but how many of us really know much about it? Um, I've got a friend who lives in Taiwan who I was thinking of visiting later in August. You should. Until I did my knees it's, oh, it's, pretty, it's <laughs> an amazing, it's an amazing country. Um, so I'd love to go there, but I bet I would pick the week that China is. <laughs> uh, no, my luck at the moment. Ryan? Well, I can't compete with the knowledge that Jonathan I'll has. I'll have a go. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I think I, I tend to agree with Jonathan that uh, she should go and show support and solidarity with Taiwan. Uh, I think it is important that the West stands up to belligerent actors, whether it's Russia and China. Um, and, you know, in my view, what happened with Russia after um, it invaded Crimea in 2014... It was business as usual. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, Putin has now decided to go into Ukraine because the West wasn't strong enough uh, and changing its economic model with Russia. Uh, so I think, you know, small acts early uh, are better in terms of showing strength against these more belligerent actors. Robert? Well, I think it's fascinating the way that the US has 
has has been on a journey. I mean, and the UK has been on the journey as well. I mean, you know, Sunak and Trust are both competing to be the most hawkish on China. When you know, just eight years ago, Cameron and Xi were knocking back uh, points at the at the Checkers local. Um, so you know, in America, I think this is actually probably, arguably, Trump's greatest legacy as a decisive shift in U.S. policy to seeing China um, not as a sort of a strategic partner, but a, or even a strategic competitor, but a but a strategic adversary. Um, and you know, the the U.S. has as Jonathan said, always had this kind of, it, it, you know, well, not always, but you know, ever since Nixon went to China, it's it's been sort of doing this delicate thing of not quite acknowledging China, t- t- Taiwan as a country, but not quite confirming that it would defend Taiwan, but kind of, you know, saying that you know, but making it clear to China, you know, it's it's been a very very delicate dance, and you've seen that basically the dancing has stopped uh, in the last in the last few years. The U.S. is becoming both parties in the U.S. are becoming much more fir- firmly on the on the Taiwanese side. In in terms of in terms of whether she should go, I mean. You know, maybe it was a provocative action to to decide to go in the first place. But I think once she's gone, she, once she's decided to go, I think pulling out and backing down would look. I think that would look very bad for, for America, and it would very and it would embolden China hugely. Grace, you want to come in? Yeah, I mean, I just think you know a big part of why this um, conflict between the US and China has escalated has obviously been you know it's centered around a trade war. It's centered around accusations of currency manipulation. It's a recognition that the US is losing. Um, geopolitical and particularly economic heft to a growing superpower that is China. And the way that that transition is handled, because it is going to be a transition, whether it's a transition that takes place over the next decade or the next four or five decades, is going to be extremely important. And over the last kind of 10 years or so, it's been handled very badly by the US. You know, as you just mentioned, both the the Democrats and the Republicans have been very hawkish on China. But China And even even if it meant damaging their own economy, which they did through this trade war. China has become massively more aggressive. The Wolf Warrior diplomacy. If you look at the indices of, you know, attitudes towards China in every in every single country pretty much they have gone very very but slightly I mean, negative I, you know, in the last that, few years that, cha- that index of, changed extremely quickly over the course of covid because china was at the, you know the no, donald no, trump no, was no, out there the, saying over, it was the china virus no, or whatever over the, over, the last, was, over the last 10 years it's not covid it's, it there was a big shift over like been, during covid where people suddenly thought oh the covid is all china's fault like you cannot I think, dismiss that as a as an issue. And like, you know, if you look back to the period immediately after the financial crisis, it was the Chinese stimulus package that largely saved, saved the global economy from, you know, falling into a much more significant recession. Like there is no avoiding the fact that China is now a huge um, economic financial player in the world economy. And it doesn't make sense on any level to have the two the world's largest economies at each other's throats and fighting a trade war against one another. So I think they have to figure out a way of coming to some sort of, you know, way of living alongside one another, basically. I think everyone will agree that obviously we all need to exist with China and that obviously China has real problems and it's also, you know, one of the world's largest economies will be the biggest economy in the world in a few years' time. And clearly uh, we need to kind of make our peace with that. But I think there is a there is a delicate equilibrium. Of course. Of course, with that. And Taiwan, the worst thing of all is if Taiwan sort of became collateral damage in this mm. sort of Superpower clash, and in a similar way, the Ukraine. But I mean, on, on just on the on the economic thing, I mean, we've seen what dislocation has been caused by um, by by Russia. I mean, the, the damage to the like if someone basically blows up Taiwan's semiconductor manufacturers, or the Taiwanese blow them up to prevent the Chinese getting hold of them, the world that is a a multi-billion dollar hit to the world economy. It, it's, it's, the mo- it's the most damaging thing to the world economy. Well, exactly, which is imagine. why it requires, you know, a little bit more, um, you know, cool heads to prevail in any of these conflicts. Like, you can look at this as, you know, the way I think that perhaps Donald Trump looked at it, which is we are losing at the expense of China. Or you can look at the way that the world economy works as something that's much more interrelated and requires us to cooperate. OK, well, stupid tweet of the day goes to S. Hill, who says, now Ian Dale is encouraging mass air travel by saying that he'd love to visit Taiwan. <laughs> People in his position should set a climate example that he just keeps you everything cosy. You are the Taylor Swift. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, Does that mean you have a private jet? Seriously, no. I have been, I think, on a plane once in the last four years. So I think I can be forgiven a holiday at some also, point. Also, you didn't legit. say you wanted to fly there. You could have. You mm, could. You could, could take a, a train. Good cruise. Or a cruise. No, I'm never. Not really into cruising. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? Why is that? Take a that break. That took me a while. Take a break. But I got anyway, it on that note, let's go to the news headlines at eight thirty-three with Andy Ivy. <laughs> 
Former Conservative leadership candidate Penny Mordaunt has announced she's supporting Liz Truss in the race for number 10. The Trade Minister says her colleague is the hope candidate in the contest for Downing Street. The parents of Archie Battersby say they'll apply to the Supreme Court to try to stop the 12-year-old's life support being turned off. He's being treated at the Royal London Hospital, which says it will prepare to withdraw treatment after midday tomorrow, unless directed otherwise. Several of England's Euro 2022 winning team are being honoured by their hometowns to recognise their achievement. Skipper Leah Williamson will be the first person to receive the freedom of Milton Keynes since it became a city. Chloe Kelly, who scored the winning goal against Germany yesterday, has also been offered the freedom of the Borough of Ealing in West London. LBC weather tonight, rain in the northwest, dry and muggy in the south. Tomorrow, rain in central areas, very warm across southern and eastern England and a high of 28 degrees. LBC. Question with Ian Dale on LBC. 8.36 on LBC, you're listening to Cross Question with Jonathan Liss, a political commentator, Ryan Shorthouse, director of the Bright Blue Think Tank, Robert Colville, who's director of the Centre for Policy Studies and a Sunday Times columnist, and Grace Blakely, the economist and commentator, who has lots of books out. Would you like to name one of them? Oh, Ian, thank you for that plug. Yeah, so my first book is called Stolen, How to Save the World from Financialization. The second one is called The Corona Crash, How the Pandemic Will That's Change Capitalism. One. The third one <laughs> is As three. Yet Unnamed. Well, it's, it's not been released yet and we haven't quite decided on a title it will be coming out next year oh, in April okay. it's about democratising the economy big topics mm. that sounds a I riveting hope read on. Well, yeah, I'm sure I will I'm, 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 just, I'm, I'm just wondering what, what's next after the presidents and prime ministers oh, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Yeah. the chancellors of Germany <laughs> no 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 we're doing but the next book is called On This Day in Politics British Political History in 365 Days that's oh, fun I, 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 would, I love very that good, great you should very make a good calendar Christmas present oh, yeah. book out on, the, out on the 6th of October anyway I'm going to get shouted at in a minute uh, Sean <laughs> in concert is our next caller hello Sean hello Ian mate hello Pono I'm, I'm getting a book out. I cannot stand the Tories. That's what I've called it. But anyway, <laughs> that's another <laughs> second. Love uh, it. Can you, can you tell me if Keir Starmer shot himself in the foot with the unionists after controlling his uh, 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 sidekicks? What you mean by sacking Sam Tarry over the, um, yeah, well, ostensibly uh, over attending yeah, a picket line? Mandy should take over. Well, she attended a picket line today, didn't she? Yeah, and no, that's good for her. Good for her. We're the right, working well, class, mate, not the Tories. OK, Sean. Um, Grace, I mean, you complained when I came to you first on a difficult this question. This is fine. So let's I'm happy. This is, you know, this, this is good. Um, I mean, yeah, I completely agree with what John, Sean just said. You know, the clues in the name. It's the Labour Party. The Labour Party was formed by unionists, by organised labour to represent the interests of working people. The fact that Keir Starmer has been 
you know, singularly unable to do that during the biggest upsurge in labour militancy that we've seen since the 1970s, when working people are literally organising to avoid pay cuts. Because unless you're getting a wage increase in line with inflation, you are getting a pay cut at the time at a time when you know costs are rising across the board after a decade of wage stagnation uh, in the midst of a housing crisis. Um, the fact that the party of working people cannot stand with working people who are literally just saying we want our wages to be raised in, in line with inflation is, to be honest, utterly astonishing. And I would not be surprised if unions like, for example, Unite did decide we want to disaffiliate from the Labour Party because it is not doing its job. Its job is to represent the interests of working people. And at the moment, it is not doing that. But if you were leader of the Labour Party and one of your front benches... <laughs> You said it. <laughs> and one of your front benchers directly disobeyed an order not to uh, attend a picket line. And then not only that, went on the world's media and announced policies that weren't official I mean, party policy. I think, you couldn't stand for that, could you? Well, look, I think the issue is here that Keir Starmer ran on a platform where he said he would stand by trade unions, where he said that he would support a bunch of policies that he has now just completely denied ever having any knowledge of. And the fact that some of his front benches, the fact that some of his MPs are themselves taking it, taking responsibility to push for those policies in public is, I think, you know, legitimate and correct. I don't think you can have a moral problem with members of the Labour Party, like, pushing for policies that Keir Starmer himself, just, you know, a few years ago, said that he would support. Ryan? Well, I think a party which is aspiring to be in government uh, needs to be in the business of finding solutions in disputes rather than taking one side or the other. Uh, and I think there's a real risk for the Labour Party. But they're not in government now, are they? And they're, they're not in Grace government, but they're aspiring they are the party to be of the government. workers, supposedly. Yes, but they're aspiring to be a party of government. Um, and what I would say is that, you know, at the moment, Mick Lynch has a lot of popularity, particularly in the world of Twitter and social media. But as the strikes continue, I think the public will become increasingly frustrated. And if the Labour Party is so strongly behind the unions in the dispute, uh, then it, it, it risks its reputation in that way. Robert? Well, I don't think anyone... Is outside Westminster bubble really has noticed this or is going to care about it come come the election. Like Sam Sam Tarry is not going to be a name to conjure with uh, come come the next general election. But I think what it does show is how divided the Labour Party is um, and how. How, how as, as Grace said, actually, how, how how Starmer is is sort of torn in two directions. He is trying to sort of present himself as as, as the moderate. You know, he has he has completely thrown over the um, the pledges on which on which he stood. But then, but then there's, there's large sections of his his party tugging him back in that direction, and it kind of makes him look look weak. It kind of makes Labour look ineffective. Um, you know, I don't think it's it, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a, like, the hugest thing in the world, but I don't think it's a good look, and I think it's going to leave a sort of bitterness within the Labour movement that that is going to last, especially if the the unions do decide right, we've had enough of this. Because Jonathan, it does take a special talent, doesn't it, that when the Tory party is ripping itself apart and providing all sorts of opportunities for Keir Starmer, then the Labour Party starts ripping itself apart as well. Well, that's the, the Labour Party's always ripping itself apart, no matter who's in charge. And um, that's, there's nothing new about that. But I do think that Starmer is playing a very dangerous game. And I would not advise him to be playing it if I were advising him, which is, he thinks... He's going to do what Blair and Kinnock did and pick a fight with the unions to make him to make him look tough, to take a stand, to make himself look prime ministerial. But the problem with that is that, firstly, a lot of people that he needs to win over are sympathetic to uh, labour conditions, sympathetic to striking workers, sympathetic to workers in general. They might be workers themselves, for heaven's sake. But also, if he is daring the unions to disaffiliate or to stand up to him or to withdraw their funding or whatever it might be, then they might just call his bluff. And if they do, then he's really got trouble. He's got political trouble because there's that, you know, precipitates, you know, all that war in the Labour Party and party management and, you know, and also a, a massive financial problem. How do you plug the, that, that, mm. fina that funding gap in the Labour Party if you have, you know, a massive, massive chunk of its funding? You do, but presumably if the to if, fight an election, but Yeah, and presumably if the unions do that, I mean, the only real opposition to the Tory party is the Labour Party. If they're not going to be well, that's sustainably what he, that's funded, what he's, that's then what you're going to end but, up you know, with... Well, they, 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 
into a battle, don't you? Because obviously he thinks that that's what they think, that any Labour Party would be better than any Tory any Tory government. And obviously I think that, and a lot of people think that, but he can't be sure there are people, there aren't people in the unions who don't think that. And they think that if you're just going to have someone who's not prepared to stand up for working people, who's going to be tory light, then just let the Tories do their worst. There are going to be a lot of people who will also be looking at this and just thinking, what is the Labour Party for if it cannot stand up for just a basic maintenance of people's wages at a, a time of, you know, a, the biggest cost of living crisis we've seen at least since, you know, the, the oil price spike in uh, in the 1970s. Um, probably, you know, ever, really. Um, and that is especially the case when you look at the history, you know, because the last time you talk about Blair and Kinnock, the last time that we had politicians going to war with the Labour movement, the Labour movement was strong. It was a force in mm. this country that could literally shut the country down. We have had, again, since Thatcher, who went to war with and ultimately destroyed much of the Labour movement, a secular decline in membership of um, the UK's unions, to which is a big part of why we're in the situation we're in today. I'm you know, told if it's workers can't, to go up a little. Now. It is actually, yeah. Since I think about 2016, and at least, at least partly that's been because, you know, I would argue there has been um, more positive, uh, you know, coverage of unions and unionists in the media. Um, often by socialists, you know, because the socialist movement is basically grounded in the labour movement, um, and you know. The reason that obviously we've had this decade of wage stagnation, the reason that we're in this deep cost of living crisis right now, is that when you don't have uh, union coverage in the private sector, people simply cannot like bargain for higher wages, which means that their wages are going to be eroded when prices go up. Like that is why we have the cost of living crisis we have right now. And you can talk all you want about what the government should be doing to deal with it. But unless people's wages are rising, then this is going to continue to be a problem. It's so strange because the Labour Party, you know, they, Starmer says we need to be a party in government, but we're not a party of opposition. But right now they are a party of opposition. And when you're in opposition, you need to actually show people what you believe in. He's very good at showing, and I support, you know, I support him. I want Labour to win, of course, but he's very good it's showing people what he's against, against a Tory party, rightly. Um, you know, so they're against poor conditions, fine. But you know, when it comes to basic questions like Grace is, is talking about, you know, are you advocating, you know, a pay cut for workers? That should be a, a basic, a basic principle for Labour Party. And all this well, stuff about wage price spirals, it's just it's actually not true. It doesn't work like that. And instead of looking at wages, you'd be looking at profits if you want to tackle the cost of living crisis. So there's nothing wrong with a Labour leader saying that people shouldn't get a pay cut. Well, the counterfactual would be that if you're um, a commu you know a, a hard pressed commuter, uh, you know struggling to get into work, and you see the bloody unions of uh, are striking again, and you can't get into you can't get into your job, and you see the Labour Party front bench on the front lines with the with them holding the banners. I mean, you know, it's just like you know, and then you think oh, nothing's changed. It's 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 Corbyn all over again. I mean, if you actually look at the statistics, people are generally very supportive of the strikers. And actually, the more coverage there has been of the strikes, the more supportive people have been. There was that week where um, I, I was on Good Morning Britain that week, and I think they did a poll. And they did the poll at the beginning of the week, and then they, at the, the end of the I week. No, that was, <laughs> that was another time. Um, and it just showed that, you know, public support had really rallied behind the Labour movement. And I think that the more we see, you know, honest, working-class unionists in the media fighting for their and rights, it's interesting, the more support actually, there's going to be. It's interesting on the train strikes because as people have worked from home much more since the pandemic, people are probably using the train less frequently in the, in the, in the working week. The type of people who use trains tend to be more white-collar middle class in general, not always exclusively, and they're more likely to be able to work from home. So it probably hasn't felt that disruptive, mm. some of the strikes thus far. But I think the risk is, as it continues and no resolution is um, is found, then you get to the position that Robert's saying, which is, you know, people do start to get pissed off about it. Um, uh, and that's a threat to, to the reputation of the Labour Party. Apologies. Are we allowed to swear? <laughs> no, I was no, say, sorry, apologies. Sorry, 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 sorry. I never thought you'd be the I know, sorry, yeah. that's Even bad. after nine o'clock, that might be <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Ap apologies <laughs> to anyone who's offended by that. Goodness me, I'd have expected it for Jonathan. <laughs> I've never sworn on um, radio or television. Peter in East Grinstead has a comment on tonight's programme. He says, one of the best cross-questions makes a nice change from politicians trying to score points off each other. Well done. Maybe, oh, maybe we should nice. just do cross questions without any politicians forever. Now, I mean, there, now there's a thought that would be to nice. ponder on. It's 8.47. 
LBC. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. A superb performance by the Lionesses. That's what winning looks like and feels like. The extra time winner and of course the fantastic celebration that's followed. It's been 56 years we've been waiting that long for an international football tournament victory for England. Six decades. And how often have we watched it slip away? Too often at the hands of Germany. The Lionesses rewrote history. They become, I suppose, the history girls. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from seven. Listen on your radio and on Global Player, LBC. More. Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Paul says, Ian, would you please introduce think tanks with their political stance? Well, I thought Bright Blue was a bit of a giveaway. Um, and Robert did say that his own think tank was founded by Margaret Thatcher and indeed Sir Keith Joseph. So again, I think I think we've covered our bases on that one. Uh, Jonathan Liss and Grace Bakley do not have think tanks yet. Um, right, let's go to another question. It's a text question from Mary in Glasgow. Liz Truss has tonight called Nicola Sturgeon an attention seeker, suggesting the best way to respond to her complaints is to ignore her. Is this a responsible way for a possible Prime Minister to behave or is she right? Well, since that text came, came in, our eager beavers have found the sound clip of Liz Truss saying that this evening in Exeter. And I think the best thing to do with Nicola Sturgeon is ignore her. I think she's... I think... Look, she's, I'm sorry. It's a bit difficult when she's First Minister, though. She's, she's got a democratically elected position yeah, just as you would. I'm sorry, she's an attention seeker, Seb. That's what she is. An attention speaker Trump, who's appearing God. at my Edinburgh Fringe programme uh, next week. Oh. So, um... Ryan, let's come to you. You can't ignore the First Minister of Scotland, can you? I mean, all politicians are attention seekers, aren't they? <laughs> so, um, I'm or not sure about them. come on this programme. But, well, that's true. We are all <laughs> attention seekers in political public life. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, um, you know, Nicola Sturgeon, as we say, is the First Minister of Scotland. The issue around the independence of Scotland, the growing support for it, uh, the victories of the SNP does mean that at some point there is going to have to be 
um, a second referendum. I don't know. I, I don't think it's a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Um, and whether it will be in Liz Truss's premiership or not, I don't know. Um, but uh, the one thing I would say about that clip is that Liz Truss has, you know, got lots of claps, lots of applause. She's very good at this sort of stuff. Mm. Uh, and that surprised a lot of people. And I think, you know, the thing about Liz Truss is that she's been continuously underestimated in politics. Um, but she's proving herself to be a, a very effective campaigner. And that's why I think, you know, she's doing so well with the Tory membership. Um, Robert Colville, wouldn't you love to be a fly on the wall when Prime Minister Truss and First Minister uh, Sturgeon meet for the first time? Yes, although, although let's hope it doesn't get a, a, a front cover, which is talking about the... Uh, Legs it. To, yeah, talking, oh. talking, about, uh, what, talking about the length of their skirts, as, as, as happened with, uh, with Theresa May. Um, I, I, think, I, mean, I, I think it's a, it's a really good point, actually, and it's, it, it's, not, it's not a sort of... It, it's not belittling Nicola Sturgeon. It's the, 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 point, the point is, there, there are... There, there, if you want to keep the union together, there are various... You can, you know, when, you can, you can, go, you can go hard, you can fight, you can... You know, rebut, try to rebut every single thing Nicholas Sturgeon says. I think what Truss is advocating there is 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 more is an approach which is just more kind of let just let her let her howl into the into the void. You know, don't don't confront her. Just um just you know just let it let the the SNP's monomania on this issue kind of um, hi highlight itself because you know the, the 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 fact is the SNP's obsession with independence is blessing down the people of Scotland. There's all sorts of you know the the the, the, the education the, the drug death stuff the educate the, the Education before performance, like Scotland, is there are so many things which the government should be focusing on and should be held accountable for, and it's just turns turns everything into into being about independence, and that really does shortchange the Scottish people. But support for independence does continue to rise. No, it doesn't. But but Robert, no, I mean, they keep no. getting elected. But Robert, there's so. a fun, Robert, there's it, it rose, it rose, and then it's been it's been Rob tailing off gradually. I mean, it's still very substantial. Mm. But you, you you said growing support. It's not growing. It's no, there's a fundamental problem with what you're saying. Is that you don't have the right to dictate to a government what its agenda should be. The Scottish people have voted in this particular government, which had independence, an independence referendum, not even independence, in an independence referendum, which they said settled. As which they said settled the question center. for a generation. No, no, they didn't say that in 2016. They said, as Sturgeon said, that, uh, and she had it in her 2016 Scottish Parliament manifesto, that if there was a material change in circumstances, which everyone can agree Brexit was, then that would um, that would relitigate the case. Sturgeon is trying to hold an illegal referendum in um, order to distract well, from her own feelings. All, well, look, I mean, look, first of all, it's, it hasn't been determined illegal yet. The it's Supreme, going to be determined it's illegal. Well, okay, fine. Well, let's, hit, let's wait for the Supreme Court to say um, what they think uh, about the legality of it. It's actually not the point. If the, the Scottish people cannot be kept in the union by force, you're Absolutely talking about not. how you're talking about how. To, well, then, what are the options for seceding from the union? What options the Scottish people have? The SNP has stood on a manifesto of holding a new independence referendum in the last four national elections in Scotland. And it has won every single one of those elections. What more can the Scottish people and do before to some of those, And before some of those votes, including the last one, it said, this is not a referendum on independence. This is, and then as soon as it was elected, anyone went, oh, actually... What do you mean? It, has, it had an independence referendum in its uh, 2017 yeah. uh, general election manifesto, 2019, last 2021. What more, how can the Scottish people request a referendum? And how on earth is it for one person Downing Street, be it Boris Johnson Holds or Liz Truss, to overturn the rule of the, 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 the Scottish people. The Scottish people, people do, do probably want a referendum. They do not want one now. But they've they've elected a government which wants one. It had it in its manifesto. In the same way that in 2019, the people of Britain elected the Conservative government, not with the majority, a plural majority of voters, um, but they with 47%, I think, of the vote of voters in Britain elected a Conservative government. So if you'd had a kind of an idea of numerical majority, then we'd have had to have an independence referendum, a new Brexit referendum. Grace. I mean, on some level, I don't actually disagree with uh, what you've said there about the focus on independence distracting from a lot of other issues. I do also think that a big part of the reason for the ongoing popularity of the SNP is that they kind of are trying to represent this kind of third force in British politics, which is progressive on a lot of issues in line with most of the Scottish population. And also, um, you know, they have marketed themselves as relatively um, progressive on a lot of economic issues as well. And this is, I think, a big reason why people continue to support Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP. 
It's because she is basically kind of trying to market the Scottish model as a break with the, you know, ongoing neoliberal, like, that's right, basically consensus that dominates in the rest of the country. Um, but having said that, and I actually think, to be honest, that the kind of um, the language that Liz Truss is using here, which is clearly incendiary and designed to play to the crowd that she is addressing, um, only exacerbates the problem, which is that the ongoing focus on independence, independence as the only issue that matters in Scotland, will continue to distract from those issues. Having said that, as Jonathan said, it is entirely up to the Scottish people to decide this. And obviously, given their ongoing support for the SNP, which, you know, it's in the name, is about independence, they should it's be able to have right, 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 the referendum. Let, let, let's squeeze in one final question from Kevin in Oxford. Kevin, hello. Hello, Ian. Hi, what's your question, yeah. please? So, the uh, question is... Um, does uh, Penny Morden's endorsement of Liz Truss tonight just go to show that British politics is rotten to the core? <laughs> what, why do you think it does? Because uh, I think Penny Morden was offering an alternative three or four weeks ago. And I just think it's, it's, it's just a kind of a self-serving move. I think she's but there are only two candidates vote. left and she has to, like all Conservative Party members, she has to choose between them and she's made her choice. Robert Colville, well, try and keep your answers quite short. Yeah, well, um, uh, all, 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 all I'll say on this is that, um, is that two years ago I placed a small bet on Rishi Sunak to be Prime Minister, <laughs> at, the next Prime Minister at 150 to 1. So I am obviously very much hoping that, uh, that no, um, I, 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 I... Thereby yeah. proving that British politics is... <laughs> <laughs> Is that insider trading? <laughs> <laughs> I would have to have an influence Actually, over it for it to be insider trading. I have, I have declared this at, at every possible opportunity. <laughs> that is why I never bet on politics, because I think political betting, if you're involved in politics, is insider trading. But there we are. Controversial. Well, I mean, you have to have privileged well, well, information. Let's be clear. Privileged information is different. I mean, if you're yeah. a regular punter, it's different. Um, I think that... You know, I don't have a lot to say about this. Um, I, I suspect that Morden doesn't have a lot in common with Truss. Um, but, you know, I think that Morden... Well, they are let, both Conservatives. I think, I think Morden let herself down a, a, quite a bit in the in the campaign by sort of abandoning quite a few of the principles um, that she'd had, which, which actually a lot of people on the left had, had welcomed, um, such as the trans issue. But fundamentally... Morden is a politician and she sees which way the wind is blowing and she obviously presumably thinks she's going to get a job in, in Truss's cabinet and it's much better to support Truss than Sunak at that point. Ryan? Well, she's not a sore loser and she's moved on from the leadership race and she thinks Liz is the better candidate. And as, I said, as, as I've said, a lot of people have underestimated... Who are you backing? I'm not backing anyone. Um, I, I think the strengths of Liz is that she is very fearless, she's very determined, she's got a very clear vision. Everyone making her out to be uh, sort of horribly right-wing when actually her economic policy is very similar to, to the Labour Party's, which is to go for growth uh, and to reverse some of the tax rises that Rishi Sunak has proposed. But I think her weaknesses is that she can be very ideological and rigid. Uh, I think Rishi is much more details orientated. William Hague put out uh, quite an impressive video endorsing Sunak today where he talked about the qualities of Rishi as somebody who really likes to understand stuff, is very details orientated. But as a result of that, I think he can be a bit of a technocrat and lose overall vision and seem to flip-flop a bit, which is what's happened okay. during his time as Chancellor and during this campaign. Grace, very quickly. Firstly, Liz Truss's economic policy is definitely not left-wing. I don't think there are many people who would say that tax cuts for the rich and for corporations is a particularly left-wing policy, particularly at a time when we are experiencing high inflation, which is primarily being driven by profits. But... That aside, primarily I mean, really driven by profits. Yes, there's lots of evidence right now that suggests that a big part of the inflation that we're seeing right at the moment is actually being driven by profits rather than wages. And if you break it down, profits more than wages, which is unsurprising given I you know the level of wage like stagnation. COVID, anyway. Well, yeah. when you break down who's benefiting from the increase in inflation, you know, if you've got prices rising and um, you know, costs remaining the same or costs, you know, rising okay, at a certain level. Back then, to the question. So, yeah, does sorry, yeah. does anyway. Penny Morden's backing of Liz Truss prove that British you know, politics politicians, is as we've heard core. already from across the panel, are self interested. They are interested in power. That is their job. We cannot expect anything, from, anything else from them. Um, what we but not can solely. Do, not solely. Pretty, I mean, yes, pretty they are interested. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, ultimately we need to. Cynical, cynical view of cynical politics. politics. Well, yeah, you know, you have to be. And I think if you want to be able to influence politics, you have to make your voice heard. How do you make your voice heard? You participate in a movement to make sure that politicians think it is in their interest to 
who listen to you. That is how we've shifted the dial on climate. That is how we've slowly began to shift the dial on the economy. It's by people getting out there onto the streets, engaging in trade unionism, engaging in social movements to say there will be a cost to you as a politician if you do not listen to us. So in a sense, well, that means politics Jeremy is Corbyn rotten, but that is just... Three, four years talking about... Yeah, and you know what? And, and our, our political debate has changed dramatically as a result of the social movements that mobilised behind Corbyn, particularly if you look at issues like climate, but also much more generally on the economy. Right. Stuff like levelling up is what... David Cameron was hugging ranges. Huskies longer than anyone had ever heard of, David, of Jeremy Corbyn. Quick, I mean, quick, climate change was quick not... Quick fun text for the end of the programme. We're running vastly over time, so very quickly here. <laughs> Pauline in Slough. Big Brother is set to return on ITV2 next year. Would the panellists be interested in becoming housemates <laughs> and who would they like in there with them? Um, Jonathan. Um... Absolutely not. But if I was parachuted in for a vast sum of money, then I guess I'd want all kinds of people from uh, the left and right so we could just talk about politics all day long. Oh, God, I can't believe it. That would be a ratings killer, wouldn't it? Well, okay, okay. Yeah, hopefully, if there are any, if there are any no, single don't attractive don't gay men in there, that fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I must say, I'm only human. Uh, no, I don't think I would want to go on there. I don't think I'd be interesting enough. I'd probably be voted out very early. Um, <laughs> oh, don't do yourself so, down. <laughs> Uh, who would I like to go on? I just somebody who I could have a laugh with, really. Who, who who's that? Um, Miriam Margulies. Yes, I think she'd be amazing. <laughs> that would be fun. Yeah. Grace. Um, again, no, I don't think I would go on. But if I did, I think I'd like to be on with Tom Hardy. Maybe Ryan Gosling. Oh, shallow. Um, you know, yeah, just some people that I could look boring, at. And, yeah, but it would be. It would just be. I think it'd just be quite nice. You know, if you're going to do something like that and you know embarrass yourself, then you may as well do it surrounded by Robert? nice-looking people. Um, well, I, I wouldn't do it not least because my kids would murder me for uh, being away from <laughs> them for, for so long. But I, I, I'd actually, I'd actually take Johnson's model of um, of yeah, just some people like some people like some really, really politics and history nerds who we can just have lots of. Very yeah, it'd be interesting. Emily, Emily, Emily Thornberry. Emily Thornberry. The Queen. Emily Thornberry. She's very good. You meant you would want to be in with the, the, the queen. queen. <laughs> the queen is <laughs> interesting. That would be an interesting right. big brother. The producers of Big Brother are listening. I'm up for it. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Robert Colville, Grace Blakely, Ryan Shorthouse and Jonathan Liss. Lots of people saying we should never have politicians on again. Right. I'm not quite sure that will last, but you never know. You're listening to LBC. I'm a very bad presenter. It's four minutes past nine. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom, former Conservative leadership candidate Penny Mordaunt has thrown her weight behind Liz Truss in the race for number 10. The Trade Minister says her colleague represents hope in the party. The Foreign Secretary and her rival for Downing